Friends, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. As we gather in this place and in places spread all over creation, it seems, to worship and to praise our God. It is indeed a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord, wherever that house may be. For those of us who are gathered in the sanctuary this morning, for those of us who are gathered in our homes, and for even those of us who may be outside using your telephone to be a part of uh, this worship service, we are glad that you are joining with us. We are glad to be together, bound together by the Holy Spirit as we come to worship God. We have just a couple of announcements, and one of them is uh, very much in the way of housekeeping. You may recall that we have been conducting a congregational meeting for the last two weeks. And I'm pleased to report and grateful to so many members of the congregation for responding uh, so quickly and with your ballots and with emailing in to Christy here at the office. Uh, we, um, I'm pleased to report as moderator of, uh, of the session and moderator of First Presbyterian Church's congregation that we have uh, exceeded the number of votes needed to make it an official vote uh, by a wide margin. Uh, those uh, votes will be entered into the minutes of the meeting by our clerk. And we are able now to close the meeting having... Uh, conducted our business and successfully elected by mail uh, and a two-week meeting, we have successfully elected a nominating committee. Uh, our elder nominating committee and our nominating committee for the course of the next year will be Bill Childers, Susan Todd, uh, Leslie Mitchell, Robbie Hill, and Mary Bab Davis. Uh, thank you to everyone who turned around your uh, letter and your ballots so quickly and participated, and thanks to uh, Lonnie Bixler for seconding the motion and for Bill Childers for putting it into motion from the APF committee. That said, uh, as moderator of the congregation, I will bring this meeting officially to a close. Not the worship service, but the meeting. Remember, folks, we're Presbyterians. We've got to be official and we've got to do this exactly the right way, and we're trying hard to do that. So that said, uh, we do have some folks in the sanctuary with us, so I would greatly appreciate if someone would move that we adjourn our congregational meeting. Connie Parker, who you can't see, just moved that, and I would love it if someone would second that as well. And Jeanette George seconded it for us. So uh, we are going to assume, since I've never had a person vote no in adjourning a meeting, we're going to assume that all of you are at home raising your hands and raising your feet and stamping on the ground and yelling yes as loud as you can that we are adjourning the meeting uh, at this time. So friends, uh, we do have a prescribed way of doing that too, so let us pray. Lord, we're grateful that even in uncertain and different times, you abide with us still. We give you thanks that we were able to do your work even in this meeting and even in these strange uh, and difficult days. We pray your blessings on the work of this nominating committee that they may find the people that your spirit moves them to to serve this church as elders over the next three years. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, we have just closed the longest meeting I have ever presided over in my entire life. Thank you for helping and helping it go, uh, or for voting and participating and helping it go very smoothly. Now, we do have a couple of announcements for today that you need to know about. One is that we will be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion uh, during this service. Uh, many of you have taken the opportunity to come and get some bread here at the church, but if you haven't, that's okay. When it comes time in the worship uh, service to, uh, to celebrate communion, uh, you can set your own place up just as well. Uh, Use your own bread, and you may use your own uh, cup. Uh, certainly, whatever fruit of the vine seems most appropriate to your heart will be appropriate for this, uh, for this meal, for the real work here is done by the Holy Spirit. So, uh, know that we'll be celebrating communion today as we did last month, and uh, we look forward to that part of our worship service today. It's also a joy to share that next week we will be celebrating the sacrament of Christian baptism. Uh, it just so happened that last month we did the same exact pattern. We had communion one week and a baptism the following week. And it's 
coming to pass that we're doing it again this month. There was, I wish I could say that I had it all planned out that way, but I didn't. It just sort of worked out, but we are thrilled uh, to uh, be having a baptism next week. Uh, it is for Ryland. Many of you know Ryland. He is uh, uh, Wayne and Kathy Neal's grandson. He will be uh, baptized. He's a little older than most of the ones. I told him I wasn't going to pick him up and carry him around the sanctuary because he's eight. Uh, so um, that's, that's a little bit uh, of a challenge. So we're going, to, um, we're going to be excited to be a part of that. And we will again have uh, the bowl placed at the end of Hunter Hall, uh, beginning on Wednesday of this week. Uh, anyone who wants to come and be a part of this, by coming by the church uh, anytime during business hours on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, or Friday, you may come and bring water from your home, from however, you can get some here at the church, but come and bring a little bit of water and pour it into the bowl, uh, maybe touch the water and make it uh, a special a moment of prayer and inclusion for yourself as well as you remember your own baptism and you have a hand in the baptism that we will celebrate here next week. So come and be a part of that. Know that this will be another joyous day and occasion for our congregation. Finally, uh, I will tell you that we are excited to announce that we have hired an interim youth director, uh, Will Delaney, who was our Presbyterian College intern last fall and worked with our, uh, our youth has uh, started Duke Divinity School. But because of the way things are working out with the virus, he is doing it online. They told him not to come up to campus. Uh, so Will is still uh, in the area. And so we reached out to Will and Will, uh, we talked a little bit about that and as we're uh, going through this fall season, the session and the APF committee and the DCE search committee felt like it would be a wise move to bring in an interim youth director, and we are thrilled to have uh, Will on board. For those of you that came to the Vesper service last Sunday outside, uh, Will was there, he was a part of it, and uh, like any good uh, aspiring seminarian, I threw him to the wolves immediately and told him right at the beginning of the service that he would be doing the benediction. So he had about 45 minutes to figure out what he was going to say, and he did a fantastic job. So as you're able to, uh, welcome Will. When you see or hear him on social media, give him a warm welcome. Uh, we are thrilled to have him as part of our staff uh, for as long as we can keep him. Uh, we want him to be able to go to school in person, uh, but uh, we're kind of selfishly glad to have him here while we can uh, do that. Friends, those are all of our, now, our announcements today, uh, so let us again turn our hearts and our minds to God's worship. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. If you're at home, I invite you, if you printed out the order of worship, to respond. I invite the folks here to stand and join in our call to worship with response, and then our hymn. Uh, brethren, we have met to worship. You notice that the Psalm 105 is taken from the New Re Revised Standard Version and the message. And the message words are the, are the responses. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Thank, Thank God. Praise God by name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Tell, Tell everyone you need what God has done. Glory in his holy name. Sing to him. Sing praises to God. Sing God's songs. Belt out our hymns. We, we are here to worship. worship. Oh, 
Friends, let us join our hearts and our minds in prayer. Holy and loving God, we pray that your spirit will indeed abide among us this day. And the word that is read, the word that is proclaimed, the word that is lifted up to you in music, and the word that is embodied in Holy Communion. We pray this day, Lord, for uh, peace in an uncertain world. We pray this day for all who are sick and who are ailing. We pray this day for all who hunger and cry out for you. We pray, Lord, that they will know your peace and your comfort and your nourishment. We pray that we will be nourished by the meal we celebrate together this day. We pray, Lord, that you will teach us to go out and to be agents of your kingdom and indeed instruments of your peace to all we meet and encounter. We pray all of these things, Lord, as we pray for our leaders and our communities. We pray that your spirit of love and justice and peace will indeed be known throughout the world. We pray that in these days where it seems as though the world has spun out of control, that you will focus us only on you, that you will give us a time of quiet respite where we may see only you and hear only your voice. In doing this, Lord, quiet the other voices that we hear in our hearts and our minds. Quiet the anxieties that we feel in our spirits. Give us your peace. Give us your rest. And infuse us, Lord, with your hope. We pray all of these things, Lord, as we come before you this day, seeking your peace, presence, love, and abiding spirit in all that we say and do. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. We're grateful for our folks that are here today to help us worship, help us in singing, choir members, Crawford family, our production crew, Gene. It's good to have everyone here. The text of this hymn I found to be very interesting. It's written by a United Church of Canada minister who wrote it in Charleston, South Carolina. She was in Charleston for a hymn society conference and there was introduced to shake note singing. Now, if you don't know what that is, I'll be glad to explain it to you at some point. But basically, the shape of the note denotes the pitch and my grandmother played by shake notes. And this tune sort of stuck in her mind, in her brain, in this one that we just sang, Holy Man. Uh, but she was vacationing there in Charleston and walking up and down the beach, she worked out this text to the tune of Holy Man. We'll sing that now. All who hunger, gather gladly. Restlessness 
and roaming here in joy we keep the feast we that once were lost and scattered in communion's love has stood taste and see the grace eternal taste and see that God is good. All who hunger sing together, Jesus Christ is living bread. From loneliness and longing, here in peace we have been led. Bless Friends, our scripture today comes from the Old Testament. I'll be reading from Exodus, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 14. I invite you to hear now God's word to the church this day. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, and then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door stopes, the, do the two doorposts, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments, for I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ten years ago this summer, ten years ago and a month back, in August of 2010, I was finishing Greek school at Columbia Seminary. Greek school is, in my estimation, the closest thing to hazing that a Christian seminary will ever have. And in fact, Presbyterians are the only ones left that make uh, seminary students go through Greek uh, and Hebrew to get ordained. It was a hard eight weeks. 
you can ask Jennifer. She'll tell you. We had just moved to Atlanta. We'd moved with Hayes and Lane Francis. It was hot that summer. We moved the, the, the day after the 4th of July uh, for classes to start. And it was a blazing hot summer in Atlanta. And I had gone from an office to Greek school with students who were mostly 17 and 18 year, years younger than me and right out of college and used to studying. And there we were learning ancient Greek. Now I had five years of Latin in high school and in college, so I thought I would be okay for a little while. And for a while I was. I was great as I had been in high school and college with vocabulary. I could learn the words. And I was good when it came down to the other classes I would learn later uh, called exegesis. We can talk about that some other time where you learn what they were trying to say. I'm good at interpretation, but I'm not good at straight translation. And I knew that going in. And so Greek school was a routine effort for me of, uh, for lack of a better term, getting my rear end kicked pretty much five days a week and then having to go home and stew about it at night. It was hot and it was difficult. And one of the things in Greek school that was really hard for me to uh, learn and to get was all of the different tenses of the words that they had or tenses of uh, translation use, the syntax that they used. Uh, they had one in particular that was a problem for me because it was even a hard one to say. It's, it's called the aorist sense and, and, or tense. And it's the way it's spelled, it's just got an A in it that shouldn't be there and all that stuff. So you're, you're trying to even pronounce the term and it's difficult. The aorist tense in Greek, I never could quite understand. You see, in English, we understand time as the past, the present, and the future, right? That makes pretty good sense. What happened in the past? Well, that happened yesterday or five minutes ago. What's happening in the present? Well, that's right now. And the future? Well, that's stuff that's going to happen later. I get that. It makes sense. The Greeks had all kinds of words and ideas about time, though. And so the aorist tense much of the time meant the past, and I got that. That made sense to me, but not always. And then as we got into translating the Greek New Testament, I found out that it wasn't even not always, it was not most of the time, but it was hard to tell where things were changing. And then the words that I had a pretty good mastery of, well, their endings and their prefixes and suffixes would change, and the aorist tense would mess me up because as I talked to my tutor about it, he said, well, the problem is that it could mean something that happened in the past, but it may still be happening, and some of it may be implied that it's going to happen in the future. And I said, well, how do you know which is which? And he said, well, there's really no way to, to, to figure that out. You just have to get used to it. I wasn't looking to get used to it. I was looking to figure out how to know what to do. I was looking to pass Greek so that I could get ordained someday. So I got practical about it. Finally, they told me that it was most of the time in the past. And so whenever I saw something that looked even remotely like the aorist tense, I just translated as past tense. And I knew that I wouldn't always get full credit about it. I knew that the teacher would uh, take points off for it. But I wasn't trying to make an A. I was trying to get through it. So as far as I was concerned, everything in that tense had happened in the past. I was making it conform to my own ideas of past, present, and future. In one of the days that I talked with my, the guy that was helping me, was tutoring me with it, I said, this is, this is ridiculous. It's almost like a past event is alive. And he stopped for a second. He said, wow, that's really beautiful. That's a great thought. He said, it's too bad it's not really accurate, but it's a great thought, and it's beautiful, and I, I love that. And so then I was just even more frustrated. I thought I had a good preaching point there, and I, I didn't. But at any rate, somehow I survived Greek, and I got on to greener pastures of being able to interpret as opposed to translate. But I always remembered the hard problems that that 
quirky tense of Greek gave me, these, these events that to me seemed like they never quite passed away, these events that could still be alive, these things that aren't fully in the past, they don't live completely in the present, and they aren't completely in the future, they're all sort of wrapped up with each other. I always kind of wondered about that. I didn't wonder too much, I'll say, though. The truth is, I don't sit around in my free time translating Greek. I know some people that do that. It's just not one of my hobbies. Now, I tell you all of this as we just read the, the very technical side of God's instruction to Moses and Aaron and ultimately to all of Israel about how they are to observe the Passover. Moses and Aaron are hearing this in real time as they are still with their people in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh has not yet let them go. Ultimately, it is the killing of the firstborn that will cause Pharaoh to relent and let the Israelites free. But I did some research this week on what exactly happens during that Passover meal. The Lord prescribes all kinds of things for, uh, for Moses and Aaron about putting the blood on the doorposts as a sign to know that they are to be passed over. But in practice, our Jewish brothers and sisters, when they celebrate the Passover meal, the cedar meal as it is, when they practice it, they do it with a dialogue, the same way we do liturgy when we celebrate the Lord's Supper or baptism. They celebrate it with a dialogue as well, and they have for centuries. When they celebrate this meal, they center it around a question. And the question they center it around is a question that I think is worthwhile for us to consider today. The question they begin the meal with is, why is this night different from all other nights? Now you heard the history about this shall be the beginning of the year in the Hebrew calendar. This shall be the beginning of months. This meal shall mark it and the Passover shall be celebrated and remembered, but the question is to be asked by someone in the room, why is this night different than all other nights? The question is to be asked and the response is to be and then to be given that this is different because we remember on this night all of the things that God has done for us. You see, that's this, at the center of the cedar meal. That's at the center of the Passover celebration is remembering not just the deliverance from Egypt, but remembering all that God has done throughout history. This is the idea behind the Passover meal as a celebration of what God has done in that place. And in a real cedar meal, which one day we may uh, dive a little deeper in and, and do the mechanics of our own, uh, in our own place, but in, in an actual cedar meal, at one point they will take a cup, a cup filled with wine, and they will drop out 10 different drops, each one representing one of the plagues that was visited on Egypt, remembering the hardship of the time, remembering what God was doing in that place, and ultimately remembering, finally, the killing of the firstborn and the passing over of those who were God's people. So the question asked at the Passover meal, at the cedar meal, is what makes this night different? And as we as Christians come together to celebrate this day, the Lord's Supper, we have a question of our own to ask, and that is, what is it about this meal that is different from us? Aside from the fact that most of our meals don't con con uh, consist simply of bread and wine, although for some folks, Maybe so, but that's not a normal meal for us. We normally eat regular different things. Why is this meal different? How is this meal different for us? As Christians, we find our answer in 
the dialogue that Jesus has with the disciples as he establishes what we know to be communion, what we know to be the Lord's Supper, what we call the Last Supper, which in the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are set exactly on or as the cedar meal, the Passover meal, where Jesus is with his disciples. And we remember that he says, when you drink of this cup and you take of this loaf, you do it in remembrance of me. And we see the parallel there of this meal that has always been a remembrance of what God has done, a remembrance of the plagues visited on Egypt, a remembrance of the deliverance from slavery into freedom. We see that Jesus is now claiming who he is. That is, that he is truly God, God's own son, as he claims a spot to be remembered in this important meal. Later, as he dialogues with the disciples, he tells them, I give you a new commandment. And this is important also because only God gives commandments. He gives them the new commandment that we have talked about many times over these last several months, and that is to love one another, as Jesus says, the way that I have loved you. So Jesus has now reframed this meal. This Passover meal has now been reframed in a way that remembers not only what God has done throughout history, but what Jesus, as he says to the disciples in real time, remember me. Remember what I am doing. But there is a forward-looking aspect of that too, for Jesus knew what was coming over the course of the next several hours. We remember as we gather at this table what Christ has done and what Christ is doing for us. And we also, as we pray today, we'll pray a little differently than we normally do with our liturgy, but as we pray today, we will pray and remember the great things that God has done throughout creation in molding the world together out of a formless void, releasing God's people from bondage into freedom, and then visiting us with his only son and making this meal something that is different even for us. And the final question that we should probably concern ourselves as we come to the table this day is what is it that makes us different? How is it that we will be different from having been a part of this meal? Why are we different for having come to this table in these strange and difficult days? Why and how are we different? Well, that answer is tied up, friends, in the Holy Spirit. That is tied up in what the Holy Spirit does with and among and through all of us as we gather around this table, whether we're in this room right now or whether you're sitting in front of a television screen or a computer screen or an iPhone screen somewhere outside. You see, the Holy Spirit in this time and this place lifts us into the very presence of God the very presence of our Redeemer. When we say in our liturgy, lift up our hearts, and the response is we lift them up to the Lord, we trust that this action is being done by the Holy Spirit. Now, we do communion once a month. Some churches do communion once a quarter. And the church where I uh, went for my first call uh, did was very adamant about doing communion once a quarter. And, And there was one gentleman on session who was absolutely adamant about that. He felt like that if we did communion any more than once a quarter, it would not be special. It would not take on the same importance that it does if you space it out and you only do it every uh, few months. He felt like it would become routine. We ultimately did end up going to once a month there. And we talked, I and this gentleman talked about it several times, and I finally said, look, if I'm doing my job, if we're doing our job together, the way we come to the table, 
Communion should never be something that is routine, routine or, ordinary. or ordinary. Because the truth is, we should come to this table one way and leave differently. We should always come to this table in need of God's nourishment. For apart from God, we can do nothing. And we should leave both fed and reconciled to one another. Paul urges us to never come to the table without considering ourselves. We do so. We are to come before God and be reconciled to God. We are to make sure that if we are able to be reconciled to one another so that when we leave this table, we are not only nourished for the world that we're living in, but we are sustained. We are made pure and clean and we're given the resources by the power of the Spirit to go be builders of God's kingdom. We must come to this place one way and leave different. What makes this meal that we celebrate different? It's the work of the Holy Spirit on you and on me. It makes us different as we go out into the world. It's almost like the event itself is alive. The past, the present, the future are rolled up in one place. We celebrate what God has done through creation, what God has done all through the, the history of humankind. We celebrate what Christ did in his ministry and on the cross and in coming from the empty tomb. And we look forward with hope, knowing that the Holy Spirit meets us in this place and lifts us into The event itself is alive. It may not work for Greek, but it surely applies to what we are living and going through today. You see, these are difficult days. It's hard to understand what is happening from day to day, but we remember in this place, as we celebrate and as we look back, we remember that God has sustained God's people all throughout history. That Christ came to us in the darkest of days and redeemed us when we were in need of redemption but not deserving of it. And the Spirit molds us and transforms us and equips us to go even into this strange and uncertain world knowing that no matter what we are God's people and we are loved and we are sustained, and we're nourished by this special meal. And we will come back and gather at this table again, not too far in the future. So friends, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, we are told in Holy Scripture that they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. This table that is prepared and set before us is not set with human hands, but is prepared and set by our Savior, 
who beckons us all to come to him, to come to this table and to celebrate, to remember what God has done in the past, to remember what Christ has done and what Christ is doing, and to look forward with hope as we are sustained and nurtured by the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, come to this table, not because you are worthy, but because we are needy. Come to this table, not because you are fed, but because you are hungry. Come to this table. Come and celebrate. Friends, we begin our liturgy this day. You may have an order of worship in front of you. You may not, but these words should be familiar, and I will walk you through them. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift your hearts, and we respond by saying we lift them up to the Lord. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, and we respond by saying it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Friends, let us join together in prayer. Holy and loving God, who spoke over the waters at creation, who brought everything that is into being at the power of, of your word, we come before you grateful this day that you gather us as your people. Even as we are not able to gather in person together, you still bind us together by the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks, Lord, that you spoke to your people throughout the ages. You made promises and you kept them. You spoke to us through your prophets, calling us back to your way and speaking out for the poor and the oppressed. Prophets who spoke for those who had no voice. You taught us what righteousness meant, Lord. You taught us what judgment meant, and you taught us, most of all, what mercy meant. We see this in your prophets and your apostles and your martyrs. We hear your words in Holy Scripture, and we learn how we might move forward each day. We give you thanks, Lord, that in the fullness of time you came to be with us, in the person of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, who was born of Mary, you came to be a part of your creation. In Jesus' ministry, you taught us what it was to be in fellowship with you. In the ministry that Jesus performed throughout the world, or throughout his world, we saw what kindness and mercy and healing really looked like. We saw the sick healed. We saw the blind able to see. The deaf were able to hear and the lame were able to walk. Jesus taught us what it meant to live in community with one another. What it means to be a good neighbor to all we encounter what it means to love one another the way he loves us. Still, our world rejected Jesus, and yet he loved us still, going to the cross on our behalf, giving forgiveness to those who hurt him so deeply and those who killed him, and then rising from the grave and setting us all free from death and offering us eternal life. We give you thanks, O Lord, that in Christ's life and death and resurrection, we are indeed made part of the body of Christ. We are offered salvation and hope for the future. We give you thanks, Lord, for the communion that we celebrate this day. We give you thanks for the community of saints that have come before us in this place and believers and every time and place with whom we celebrate, with whom we give thanks to you, with whom we are lifted into your presence as we are sustained and nourished by this meal. 
And in all of these things, Lord, we come before you and humbly pray the prayer that you teach us to pray over and over again, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that our Savior was betrayed, he was at table with his friends celebrating a meal at the time of the Passover. And even as they remembered what God had done, he gave thanks for the bread that was before them. He blessed it and he broke it. And he said to them in that very space that this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. May take, you may partake of your bread at this time. In the same way, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he poured it out for them, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you take of this bread or you drink of this cup, you will do it in remembrance of me. You may now partake of the cup. Friends, let us pray. 
Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for calling us to this table. Nourish us and sustain us as we leave this place. Nourish us and sustain us to do your work, to be your people, and to always remember what you have done and what you are doing for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, go from this place knowing that this meal that we have celebrated together is indeed an event that is alive. It truly has no past, no present, and no future. It is truly an event that is all of the three made one together by the power of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Go knowing that we are nourished in this place, made whole, and given the strength to navigate an uncertain world. So friends, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to that which is good, return no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>